Hi students, this video lecture is over chapter 28 on the special theory of relativity. All right, so we are uh, now at a point where uh, we're in the 20th century, uh, as far as physics is concerned. We have left of uh, 1800s and uh, any other previous time. And physics um, in the 20th century and beyond is termed modern physics. Okay, so let's uh, kind of take a look at where we are right now in the course. So in the course so far, we have gone, we started with chapter 18, and we did what was called electromagnetic theory proper. That's what I, that's what I call it. And that covers like chapters 18 through 24. And um, generally, what I uh, what what, what I uh, refer to as electromagnetic theory proper is the study of uh, such concepts as uh, electric charge, electric and magnetic force, Um, electric, mag I will say forces, electric and magnetic fields, and applications of Maxwell's equation. Find all of Maxwell's equations in chapter 24 in source free space. And we were able to show that electromagnetic field or electromagnetic uh, field propagates as waves at the speed of light. And this led us into the study of optics. So the second part we would say is, um, I would say optics. And we have what's called geometrical optics. and wave optics. So geometrical optics, as we recall, is, is the study of light, the propagation of light. However, it interacts with objects or holes, or the better term would be apertures, that are much larger than the wavelength of light. And so we can actually approximate to, to, a, to good precision that the light, instead of electromagnetic wave, we actually have a, a ray. A, a geometric ray. And so this covers chapters 25 and 26. And in situations where we can't make that approximation, um, where we have to, um, where we have to uh, uh, consider the wave properties of light, that would be chapter 27, that's wave optics. So if you look at geometrical optics, you study such, such things as refraction, reflection, lenses, mirrors. And in chapter 27, we talk about such concepts as interference and diffraction. concepts that cannot be covered by geometrical optics. All right, so that's where we are right now. And that took us to the end of chapter, uh, of chapter uh, 27.
Now, at the turn of the century, uh, people started asking, people started, people, we had excellent, seemingly complete theories at the time. We had the great amalgamation electromagnetic theory that happened in around 1870 with, uh, by Maxwell, showing that electricity, magnetism, and optics are all manifestations of, electro, of the same electromagnetic field. We also have a very successful theory of thermodynamics and the theory of mechanics. And so physicists were kind of drunk on their own success to some extent, and they kind of felt that everything was, was for the most part, complete and finished, and there's nothing else for uh, anybody to study after this. They just had to kind of you know, tidy up a couple other things, and that was it. And so in September of 1899, probably I would say the elder statesman physicist at the time was Lord Kelvin. Had Maxwell lived long enough, it would, it would have been him. But Lord Kelvin uh, gave the State of the Union address, if you will, for physics at the turn of the century, going from the 1800s to the 1900s. And he gave the famous, what we call the two cloud speech. So Lord Kelvin uh, gave, in, I'm sorry, in, 18, in September 1899, Lord Kelvin gave the, what we call the famous two cloud speech. And this was the more or less the State of the Union address for physics. I mean, made by the elder statesman physicist at that time. I mean, if today we're having a State of the Union address, I would think it'd be probably most appropriately given by Stephen Weinberg, for instance. You know, Stephen Weinberg also is a massively accomplished physicist. He's a, he actually is, he's also, he's responsible for one of the great amalgamations in physics, the amalgamation of electromagnetic theory and the weak nuclear force. And, then, and, and when, he, when he got the Nobel Prize in 1979, he was at Harvard University, but he's for the last 30 plus years, he's been right south of us at, U, at UT Austin. So I would say that if, you know, if a state union address were to be given by an elder statesman physicist today, it would be Weinberg. But at the time it was, it was um, Kelvin and Kelvin kind of more or less reflected the sign of the times. And uh, in, in Kelvin's speech, so in the speech, Kelvin more or less said, I, I really feel sorry for future physicists, future people studying physics, because we pretty much have it all solved. We have a couple of clouds in the horizon. Well, those clouds turn out to be, turn out to be revolution. One is quantum theory, one is relativity. So again, in the, uh, in the two cloud speech, uh, Kelvin expressed uh, a feeling of pity or future physicists because he felt that almost everything has been solved. except for two clouds on the horizon. As he puts it. Well, those two clouds were more or less relativity and quantum theory, which were revolutions that more than encompass the 20th century. 
So we will be studying these uh, topics for the really for the rest of this class. So we will be studying relativity in this chapter, quantum theory in chapter 29, and then I would re really refer to the last two chapters as applications of quantum theory. One is the atom atomic physics, one is nuclear physics. But again, Kelvin couldn't have been more wrong, but I would not really fault Kelvin because it was a sign of the times. I mean, you're, you're talking about the greatest amalgamation in the history of science had just occurred 30 years earlier. So the, I mean, the beauty and the absolute amazement of, of electromagnetic theory and to, under, to know that we, uh, we can understand electrical and magnetic and optical phenomena so well that they are manifestations of five equations. That makes, makes that gives you a, a feeling of incredible, of tremendous power. And then on top of that, uh, thermodynamics was very well advanced and mechanics also was, was also advanced. So you're talking major areas of physics had very solid watertight theories. So I mean, it, I would not, I would not blame people like Kelvin. Uh, for for uh, feeling this way. Now, Kelvin was a brilliant physicist, and that's why we had the unit of temperature named after him. I mean, he was, he went to uh, Cambridge and he was 15 years old. So, I mean, we're talking somebody who is a brilliant person. It, he was just, again, the sign of the times, right? And so, so for the rest of this class, we talk about what we refer to as modern physics. All right, and so in this chapter, or no, Chapter we're going to talk about in here is the theory of relativity. Theory of special relativity. Essentially, what Einstein, this is again, as, as, you, as you imagine, this is a product by Albert Einstein. Einstein, who was only 26 years old at the time, so at age 26, Einstein overturned Newton. So at age 26, Einstein showed <coughs> that Newton's, that, uh, Newtonian mechanics is wrong for objects at high speeds, for objects at speeds of, of an appreciable fraction of the speed of light. So for objects moving at an appreciable fraction of the speed of light. Now, you know, again, Albert Einstein was a young guy at the time. Uh, somebody, I'll, I'll talk a lot about Einstein here coming up because this is his chapter. But, you know, he was an out-of-the-box thinker and somebody was kind of on the outskirts of, of, of the physics community anyway. So for him to come in and, you know, and, and, you know, the physics community doesn't exactly take too well for their great master, Isaac Newton, being told, you know, said he being told he's wrong. You saw the war that was fought um, regarding light. Newton dominated uh, the what you know how people viewed light. Uh, you know he, he believed the light was a stream of particles called. He had a corpuscular theory of light as we talked about, as we talked earlier. Very few wave adherents came into the in, you know in, into being. You know and you could count them on one hand. We had we had you know we had uh, uh, Christian Huygens 1678. Then finally we had Thomas Young in 1801. Finally, Augustin Fresnel in 1819, and finally, James Clerk Maxwell with the full true electromagnetic theory in 1870. Again, counting on one hand how many people would dare be wave adherents, where, you know, Newton dominated it. So you're, now you're talking about some young guy 
who is going to overturn Isaac Newton. So you can imagine relativity was not initially accepted with open arms. You know, people wanted to fight against, you know, people are like, oh, you know, what do you mean Isaac Newton's wrong? You know, so and, anyway, Newtonian mechanics, as, as we'll see, is, is perfectly fine for any kind of macro, any, any space of any macroscopic object we'll ever see. I mean, you know, even a hypersonic aircraft goes at a speed, very, very tiny fraction of the speed of light. So again, a hypersonic aircraft doesn't need relativity. So any, so you don't see relativistic effects with macroscopic objects. Microscopic objects, yes, like electrons, protons, neutrons, they, they can go, get beta particles, you know, they go, to, they, they go to speed of light, or I'm sorry, not speed of light, but appreciable fraction of the speed of light. Okay. Then we have chapter 29, which is quantum theory. Essentially, quantum theory is the physics of the very small. The physics of the microscopic or smaller. Physics is totally different than, than our experience at this very small level, at this very small uh, um, extent. It's unlike anything we would ever experience in a, micros in a macroscopic world. Quantum theory is very different and, the, and you cannot get away with, uh, it's not optional to use quantum theory. Quantum theory is a must. You cannot explain the physical universe without quantum theory. Okay. And then I would say the last two chapters, chapter 30 and 31, are just an application of quantum theory. Chapter 30 is atomic physics. That's the physics of the atom. Again, the atom is certainly, I mean, atom is on the order of an angstrom or on, on, on the order of nanometers, certainly in a quantum realm. And smaller than that is nuclear physics. That's the physics of the nucleus. That's the center of the atom. It's on the order of the, it's on the size of 10 to the negative 15 meters. Certainly quantum mechanics. And that takes us to the end of the class. That's what we have left. Modern physics. So generally speaking, when you see the word modern in front of, I mean, as, a, as an adjective or, or as a descriptor, it usually means 20th century and beyond. You know, when you see modern music, you know, essentially you have what we refer to as classical music, like Beethoven, Bach, Handel, you know, Schubert, you know, musicians like this, composers like that. They, they, that's classical music. And then, you know, their, the 20th century, at least the beginning of it, was a very tough century. A lot of really, uh, you know, extreme things happened in the 20th century that called into question humanity. World War I, World War II, some of the terrible things that had happened in the 20th century. And so people wanted music to reflect that. They wanted music to give you, not just give you comfort, but sometimes give you discomfort. So the concept of modern music was sometimes, sometimes you'd have music that was made to be unpleasant as opposed to, you know, the nice soothing music that you get from, you know, the, the from the, from the, let's say from the uh, Viennese uh, uh, composers and in um, the Baroque era and things like that. And so again, and, and again, people back in the day did not say, yes, I'm doing classical music. I mean, they basically, uh, it became classical music when you had another kind of comparative music to, uh, to, uh, to refer to it. You know, it's just like people say, you know, back in the, when I was growing up in, a, you know, in the 1980s, you had 80s music. And that was the music of the day. Today, we call it, you know, people, I, I've heard it called oldies, right? Well, back in the day, they didn't call it oldies, but they do now, you know? So, so again, it's all, it's all relative, you know? So, and you look at like, say, modern algebra, you know, the algebra that we, you know, you study in, in school, I mean, in high school, well, that's algebra that is specifically developed for an application. 
you have the algebra of real numbers. Okay, and that's the algebra that really developed because you needed to understand how to manipulate real numbers and variables. And then eventually you had linear algebra. You know, you have understanding of vectors and matrices. Well, in the 20th century, people started looking at algebra in an abstract way. You know, what does it mean to have an object and a set? What does it mean to multiply in the most general sense? Not particular in a specific sense, like not multiplying matrices or multiplying vectors or multiplying uh, real numbers, but what does multiplying mean? What does add mean? And if, I, if, and if I take two numbers and I say multiply them, they're from the same set, I should get a value that's in that set. What does an identity? I mean, these are you know, looking at al an algebra in the most abstract way. That was the 20th century. Refer to this abstract algebra. For instance, group theory came out of that. And, and people use group theory in physics. People use group theory to understand symmetry. People uh, use group theory to actually predict Laws of physics when you're doing particle physics, you know. So again, this is you know a, you know a comparative of your classical algebra compared to your modern algebra. Well, physics is basically the same way. We started asking very fundamental questions in physics. How can I, it, you know, like I used to be able to think that I can measure distance and time with infinite precision, but can I? And what does a measurement of time really mean? And, and then there was unanswered questions. And so, you know, at the end of that, you know, toward the end of the 20th century, there are a number of unanswered questions. So again, you know, there were very strong theories. You know, uh, by the end of the twenty, by the end of the eighteen hundreds, you know, again, as I mentioned, mechanics, thermodynamics, all the stuff we've studied so far, electromagnetic theory. That includes optics. Even with these very strong theories, there were a number of unanswered questions. There were a number of phenomena that was unexplained. I'll just mention a few here. I mean, there's, there's quite a bit. We did not understand. I mean, this goes all the way back to Maxwell and the kinetic theory of gases. You know, at some point, we know that the average energy, let's say, of a, of a diatomic gas is what? Five halves KT, right? But remember, you have the situation where, you know, if I have a diatomic gas, let's say diatomic hydrogen. Well, it turns out, that if I imagine at, at low temperatures, I get, you know, if I imagine, you know, I get three halves KT, even though I know it's diatomic, and suddenly it switches at some temperature and it goes down to five halves KT. Five halves KT is what I would expect, but it's like something switched on. It's like all of a sudden, some mode, I mean, an energy was, was achieved and the switch on, there's a mode, a quantization. Nothing can explain that from classical physics. And if you keep on adding, you know, at, um, increasing the temperature, you eventually get to seven halves KT. Again, these are sudden steps, quantization. And you only expect five halves KT. Well, we understand that, you know, with quantum mechanics now, that there wasn't enough energy to get the rotational modes. There's two rotational modes. Remember, I'm talking about that. Basically, the particle at lower, at lower enough energy acts like it's just a, a point particle. 
Eventually, you get enough energy to excite the, the rotational modes, and eventually, you get enough energy to excite the vibrational modes. But nobody could understand that at the time. Again, this was a mystery. And this was, this was pointed out by Maxwell. So again, uh, the quantization of energy and, um, uh, and um, allowed energies in the gas. So the quantization of energy of the thermal, of thermal energy in a gas, unexplained. Nobody understood it. Uh, another one was the, the physics behind radiation heat transfer. Black body radiation is called. Black body radiation was unknown. Nobody can understand it. Black body radiation requires quantum mechanics. So basically the radiation of heat, basically radiation heat transfer requires quantum mechanics. Nobody understood it. Then we have, you know, um, some substances seem to just generate its own heat. In fact, you know, some substances uh, gave off X-rays or even gamma rays, where you can actually take X-rays to see, you can actually see the bones of your hand. We had this radiation, which we found out was eventually nuclear radiation. Didn't understand it. We knew about this. Or even atomic radiation. I mean, these are gamma rays here. How about X-rays? This is atomic radiation. Atomic X-rays come from the atom, come from electronic transitions. So as confident as we may be, we had a, a lot of things that we still needed to understand. And requiring these two clouds, if you will, um, to explain it. I, and again, as I said, these two clouds are revolutions. All right. And so, um, so let's look at relativity now. So we have into the picture walks the, what I would pretty much any, anybody would argue is the greatest physicist who ever lived. And that is Albert Einstein. So talking about Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein, out of the box thinker, okay? He lived from 1879, he was born on March 14th, Pi Day, basically, 1879. He died in 1955. He lived to be 76 years old. Okay, he was born in Germany. And he's a German Jew. Now, he did not really ID with Germany per se. And he eventually became a Swiss citizen. I mean, he became a Swiss citizen early on. So first, he became a Swiss citizen. And later a US citizen. So Einstein referred to himself as a, uh, as a, um, I guess a citizen of the world, as he called it. You know, he always said, he said he was a citizen of the world. And in many, in many respects, he was. He kind of belonged to everybody to some extent. And so Einstein, um, you know, got his PhD. And he, being the out of the box thinker, being the person who marched to a different drummer, nobody really liked him. The physics community did not want him. So by the time he was like 24 years old, he pretty much was a burned out failure. Nobody wanted him. He couldn't find a professorship. He barely could even find an instructorship. 
So he finally gave up and he became a technical expert third class of the Swiss patent office. All right. So again, you know, Einstein was not wanted by the physics community. A lot of it is, is Einstein just did his own thing. Einstein was somebody who uh, was truly an out of the box thinker, marched to his own drummer. And, you know, a lot of times people don't like that. What, what makes you so special? You, you march to your own drummer, right? And so Einstein could not find, could not get a professorship. He could not land a professorship. Or even an instructorship, or even or even a, a position as an instructor. Even though he had a PhD in physics. So, you know, not, you know, thinking about how great he is, not a good start. Pretty, you know, pretty uh, humble start. Now, so he basically gave up getting into the physics community. And he more or less became a patent clerk. So, so Einstein... Einstein became a, what was called a technical expert third class. Uh, at the uh, Swiss patent office. He's already a Swiss citizen. Okay. During this time, I, you know, Einstein was able to do a lot of thinking. The job didn't exactly challenge him too much. So he spent a lot of time thinking about physics. He did physics in his spare time. He referred to this period of time as, as a splendid isolation from the physics community. So, so essentially Einstein worked on physics in his, in his spare time. what he called splendid isolation. From the physics community. So during that time, again, Einstein was still a very young man. At that point in time, in 1905, Einstein had what was called, what was deemed the Anna Mirabilis, the year of miracles. That year, he published four papers, any one of which would have gotten a Nobel Prize. Okay, again, 26 years old, out of nowhere. Nobody had heard of him. Albert who? Nobody had, had any idea who Albert Einstein was. 
Okay, and so the famous year 1905. So in so in 1905, and what has been called the Anna Mirabilis. Einstein published four Nobel, Nobel laureate worthy papers in a single year. One of the papers actually got a Nobel Prize. So what we're studying in this lecture is so two papers on special theory relativity. As I said, overturning Isaac Newton. Then he had a paper on what's called a photoelectric effect. We'll talk about that in chapter 29. So in that, we essentially, he shows that light is a particle as well as a wave. And uh, he laid down the, the seeds of quantum theory. And the fourth paper is the theoretical uh, explanation of Brownian motion. which is the proof of the existence of atoms. Not bad for one year. So again, we did not even know, we did not have actual physical proof of the existence of atoms so 1830. Remember, I told you about this in Physics One. Robert Brown, who's a botanist, left his left his house, went to his lab, went to go look at pollen grains in a suspension, and saw that they're dancing around in random ways. And Brown was smart enough to realize what was causing that dancing. It was collisions by unseen atoms. And in fact, other physicists like Perrin, for instance, uh, was able to develop this concept further and not only tell you about the existence of atoms, but actually give you the size of atoms from this very Brownian motion. Okay, Einstein explained it theoretically. Now the concept of the photoelectric effect. Now this was kind of walking out on a limb because again, 1870, yea, verily, light is a wave. There's no doubt about it. What are you talking about the lights of particles? But Einstein not only showed you a life supporter, he actually showed you how to deter determine it experimentally. This is kind of one of the kind of the rare papers. Also, if Einstein stuff is theoretical, this uh, photoelectric effect was a very much an experimental oriented paper. So he showed you, yeah, I understand that light is a wave, as Maxwell showed you, but look at this experiment. You work on this experiment, and yay, verily. Light is also a particle. It turns out that in the war, of what is what is light? It turns out that both the the particle, the Newtonians who, who believed in 
light as a, as a, as a, uh, as a stream of particles and the wave adherence were both right. Quantum mechanics gives what's called a wave particle duality. The light is both a particle and a wave. And later on, we find out that everything is both a particle and a wave. Okay, so again, it's kind of funny how, you know, you, you see two warring factions and they turns out that they're both right. All right, and so, all right, so the topic of this was, oh, let, let me put this way. So again, this is, this is, this behavior or this accomplishment would have made anybody in the greatest physics, but this is not even the greatest work that Einstein did. Okay, so later on, you know, Einstein decided I mean, his next task was to understand gravitation. And by 1917, he published a general theory of relativity. So again, I notice I said earlier, special theory of relativity. Well, special theory of relativity, as we'll find out, does not involve accelerations. The general theory of relativity is the true understanding of gravitation. So in 1917, Einstein published the general theory of relativity. Which gave the true explanation for gravitation. I mean, it's kind of an embarrassing little secret that Isaac Newton had. Isaac Newton was able to calculate the, for, the gravitational force of two, two objects, but he had no idea how it actually worked. Einstein showed how it worked. And it's kind of funny at that time, 1917, the world was involved in World War I, right? And so people looked at Einstein's general theory of relativity and the first thing, of course, they wanted to do was go out there and perform experiments. So as the story goes, you know, you know that you wanted to get a, an eclipse of the sun. And the idea is, well, if the sun is dark, you can see stars around the sun. So you have an eclipse of the sun, right? So eclipse of the sun. And the idea is that one of the predictions that Einstein made was that that gravity bent light. Light was bent by gravity. And so if you know there's a star right here compared to the sun, well, if light truly was bent by gravity, that star would, should not appear located at where, where it should be located, but it'll appear to be deflected. It'll appear instead to, let's say, be located over here. So it'll be an angle of deflection. And people try to calculate that to try to verify Einstein's general theory of relativity. And so unfortunately, the first location of this Total eclipse of the sun, as the story goes, is right around in Russia. See, these German scientists are over there in Russia, and they're setting up an experiment to go and verify Einstein's general theory of relativity. And some Russian soldiers came by and says, what are you guys doing? Oh, well, we're German scientists, and we're setting up, uh, we're, we're trying to verify Einstein's general theory of relativity. The Russian soldiers are like, well, I don't care who you think you are. We're, you're German and we're Russian and we're at war. And you're now prisoners of war. So these guys got captured as prisoners of war. Even though all they're trying to do is just verify Einstein's general theory of relativity. So we had to wait until the following year. At that point in time, the, um, the, there was some island, I think, that uh, for, for, I can't remember exactly where, where the next solar eclipse is going to happen. So at that point in time, a whole bunch of people were interested. You had you had a whole group of Americans, you had Germans, you had French, you had Russians, you had all, all these people fighting, you know, English, you know, fighting for a best place to see the, the eclipse, right? And so finally, they were able to they were able to demonstrate Einstein and 
and, and verify Einstein's general theory of relativity. And, and that's when Einstein became a rock star. You get this guy who was hundreds of years before his time and coming up pretty much with this enormously complicated theory all by himself, pretty much out of his head. But even then, that's not all that Einstein did. Einstein also laid, laid down the, the basic understanding of the laser. So Einstein gave the theor a theoretical understanding of the laser. The laser today, we can thank Einstein for that as well. Einstein didn't quite live long enough to see the first laser. The first laser uh, was, uh, was built in 1960. Einstein had died five years pre previous. That's too bad, but again, he laid down the theory for a laser. Laser is an extremely important um, technological uh, application today. And Einstein, um, one of the things that uh, a young uh, physicist by the name of Leo Zillard was in the laboratory and he noticed uh, what was called a neutron chain reaction. Essentially a neutron, he could shoot a neutron at a nucleus or at an atom and split the nucleus. And not only would the nucleus split, it would also give up more neutrons. And those neutrons would split atoms. And since you'd have a chain reaction, Leo Zillard understood this immediately, that this could lead to an, a nuclear bomb. And so he immediately went to Einstein, who was actually at Princeton at the time, and was very concerned and uh, explained that we better do something about this. We better write a letter to Pre President Roosevelt before Hitler got his hands on this technology. And so Einstein, uh, did exactly that. So he wrote a letter to Franklin Ro President Franklin Roosevelt, which got the Manhattan Project started, which actually uh, created the very first ever nuclear bombs, the, bom the very bombs that were dropped on Japan in World War II. So we as a human race are always defined, if you will, we call it, we, we live in an age, if you will, based upon what we make our weapons out of. Stone age, you know, we. People who are in the Stone Age, well, why is it called the Stone Age? Because we made our weapons out of stone. Bronze Age, why is it the Bronze Age? We made our weapons out of bronze. Iron Age, we made our weapons out of iron. Well, in the nuclear age, we make our weapons out of nuclear bombs. So Einstein, as a single human being, put the entire human race in the nuclear age. So in honor of Einstein and his great accomplishments in his great life, Time Magazine made him the person of the century. Time Magazine considered him the most important person to live in the 20th century. So a physicist. So Einstein wrote the letter to President Franklin Roosevelt Uh, informing him of the neutron train reaction. Which caused the Manhattan Project. and the first nuclear bombs. Einstein was a pacifist. The last thing he wanted to have his name on was the first nuclear bomb. But, you know, sometimes you have to do what you have to do. And, you know, you're, you're talking about a, 
you know, you ra you'd rather have the United States have their hands on this than the, the madman uh, Hitler. So, all right. So Einstein lived uh, quite a life. All right. So let's talk about his first major accomplishment was the special theory of relativity. That's what we're talking about now. So relativity, and again, a lot of physicists at this point in time um, were questioning everything. And Einstein was one of those people who really went back and questioned even the way we take a measurement. And we know, you know, back in physics one, you know, we, sometimes we lose track of this, but we know in physics one that when you do a measurement, it's always with respect to a coordinate system. Okay, and so, you know, back when we studied kinematics, all measurements, you know, all positions and velocities are with respect to a, a, what we call a reference frame. And a reference frame is a fancy term for a coordinate system. But we sometimes lose track of that. You know, when I say I'm going 55 miles per hour, well, you should say 55 miles per hour with respect to what? Oh, the stationary Earth, right? We lose track of that. Let's go back to a basic problem. Back in physics one, we really caught Einstein thinking. Okay, and this problem is the problem of relative velocity. So back in physics one, anybody have any physics one? I drew this little picture here of a, of a platform with wheels. All right, call it a cart, if you will. And here I am standing on the cart. It's a very big cart and it's going at a at a relative, you know, velocity. I'll say it's it's going at the velocity of the cart with respect to the earth. Okay, it's got little wheels on it. And it's these are very well made cart and it's so smooth that I have no idea that I'm even moving. I am moving at a constant velocity but I'm not feeling any acceleration. So for all practical purposes, it's as if I was standing still. Now, I throw a baseball. I'm gonna throw a baseball and that baseball is gonna have a velocity of the ball with respect to the cart. Let's say I throw the baseball and I'm not, I'm not Nolan Ryan or anything. So I'm, let's say I throw the baseball and I'm throwing 70 miles per hour, which is really good for me. All right, and let's say I'm on a cart that's going at 40 miles per hour. So the cart itself is going at 40 miles per hour. And you're off in the lab or you're off in the side and you're watching me. This is you. You're watching me and I ask you, and I have a way of indicating how fast I'm throwing. So I threw the ball 70 miles per hour. And you're gonna say, no, you didn't. I clocked you at 110 miles per hour. I'm like, I'm not Nolan Ryan. I sure didn't throw 110 miles per hour. Uh, but what did you see? Well, you saw relative velocity. What you saw is the velocity of the ball with respect to the earth, which is the velocity of the ball with respect to the cart plus the velocity of the cart with respect to the earth. So velocity of the ball with respect to the cart, that's the 70. And the velocity of the earth, cart with respect to earth is the 40. And you saw the 110. Okay, so you and I disagree. And yet we're both right. Why is that? Because our measurement is with respect to our reference frame. It is relative to a reference frame. 
So even though we may disagree, we're both right. Einstein thought about this even further. He says, well, let's, let's, let's uh, let me look at the problem this way. What if I'm on a cart, but I'm going at some crazy velocity? You know, I'm going at a, at a velocity near or, or a, a near the speed of light. So a velocity near C. So we have a velocity that is going at an incredible speed, maybe 80%, 90% the speed of light. And then instead of me throwing a baseball, I'm going to shoot some photons. I'm going to turn on a flashlight. There's no flashlight. And I'm going to turn on a flashlight. And the question is, how fast is this light going? I mean, I know that in my reference frame, I fully expect it to be going to speed of light. But how fast are you going to measure the light? Are you going to measure it at V plus C? Are you going to measure like 1.9 times the speed of light? So that's a question that Einstein thought about. And this gets into the, the very concept of relativity because Einstein, in his mind, nothing, nothing travel faster than the speed of light. So even in this crazy situation where I, I'm on a cart that's going near the speed of light and I turn on a flashlight, for him, you're still bound by the speed of light. And so Newton's laws would tell you, ah, there's no problem with this. It's 1.9 times C. No problem at all. You can have an infinite, you can have an infinite velocity. So Newton's laws start become, to become wrong. And it makes no sense to talk about 1.9 or 1.8 times C. So Einstein started thinking about this very carefully. And this led to the theory of relativity. So when we talk about relative velocity, again, this is you know something we talked about in physics one. You know, I talk about relative velocity. Go back to your physics one notes. The word relative. Relativity comes from the word relative. We are looking at the, the velocity relative to a reference frame. As we should always be looking that way. We should always be understanding that when you talk about a velocity, it's always relative to reference frame. We sometimes lose track of that. But that is critical to talking about relativity. It is critical to remember that a velocity is with respect to a reference frame. And I say relative, with respect, let me, let me use let me use the proper term, relative to a reference frame. So we talk about the theory of relativity. Now, a lot of what Einstein's, Einstein had a, what we, he referred to as thought experiments. So you might look at these experiments that Einstein would propose. You might think that they are, they're impractical, you can never do it. But Einstein did a lot of these, what he called thought experiments in his head. So Einstein would perform thought experiments. And here he used the German word Gedanken. They're called Gedanken experiments. Perform Gedanken experiments to conceptualize the concepts of relativity. People were not able to really verify relativity until the 1960s. In many of the cases, it was the 1960s when people were actually able to really start, they had the, they had the technical know-how to be able to try to verify these things. And I'll talk about some of these experiments. Again, Einstein was doing this in 1905. Okay, and so now what we, what we have to kind of do here at first is really follow the plan that Einstein laid out. Einstein laid out a couple of postulates. The theory of relativity entirely depends on the two postulates of relativity laid out by Einstein. 
Now, what you have to, so the plan we're going to follow is the, is, is, um, is, is, um, I'm going to lay it out right here. So our plan for relative. Okay, so in our plan, number one, we're gonna accept the postulates provisionally, okay? We're just gonna accept them. I know that's not the way of science, but for right now, that's the way we have to do it. You know, don't be asking the questions like, how could this be? Just for right now, let's accept the two postulates provisionally. Number two, um, examine the consequences of flow from these postulates. And then number three, um, we'll examine again the universal agreement of these consequences with experiments. We'll discuss some very important experiments. So the theory of relativity has been tested many times. Now, Einstein's known for a lot of great quotes. One of Einstein's quotes is, no number of experiments will prove me right, but one experiment can prove me wrong. All right, here's an Einstein quote that he more or less said with respect to relativity. So the quote Einstein, no number of experiments can prove me right. But one can prove me wrong. So Einstein's theory has been tested and tested and tested. And his general theory of relativity has been tested as well. There is a great physicist by the name of Andrea Getz over at, over at UCLA. She um, is somebody who tests general relativity frequently, and she's testing it in the center of black holes. And you know, she's performed a set of uh, very uh, very difficult test, and, and so far, well, general relativity is still holding up. But again, some people might ask, "This isn't Einstein's theory, isn't it? Isn't it right? Why are you still testing it?" Because you always test, you always challenge an experiment. Okay, so again, just like Einstein said, no number of experiments can prove me right, but one can prove me wrong. So again. We're gonna show you a number of, I'll discuss a number of experiments for you that will test the, the postulates relativity. So first of all, let's discuss the postulates. We're gonna lay the postulates down, there's two of them. And from the postulates, now the postulates are wrong. If they do not hold up to experiment, then the entire theory of relativity, special relativity is wrong because the, the special theory of relativity hinges entirely, it's based entirely upon the two postulates. So they better be right. Okay, so first postulate is the postulate of relativity. The 
postulate relativity says the following. The laws of physics are the same for observers in all inertial reference frames. No frame is singled out as preferred. Now, Galileo had a relativity postulate as well. But what Galileo said was that the laws of mechanics were the same in all inertial reference frames. Okay, so, so Galileo stated that the laws of mechanics are the same in all inertial reference frames. Remember, what, what inertial means non-accelerating. Now, we're not talking about accelerating frames. Remember, accelerating frames, we get fictitious forces that appear in accelerating frames, like the Coriolis force or centrifugal forces and things like that. We're talking about frames that are either stationary or moving uh, at a constant velocity with respect to the other. Okay, no accelerations. Accelerations, we talk about those in the general theory of relativity. In this case, we're only talking about constant velocity motion of of um of reference frames okay so again so galileo again stated that the laws of mechanics uh, are the same in all inertial reference frames that's newton's laws Einstein took this further. Einstein included all laws of physics, including electromagnetic theory and optics. Okay, so we already have a Galilean relativity. Again, the laws of mechanics, Newton's first law, Newton's second law, Newton's third law. They're the same in all inertial reference frames. But one of the things that Einstein had a problem with was that with Newton's laws, one of the things about a physical law is that they are supposed to transform one reference frame to another. Maxwell's equations would not transform. This is one of the things that gave Einstein heartache, if you will, is, is, that, is that, well, Newton's laws are, 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 are Maxwell's equations do not have the same form and various reference frames. What reference frame, what, what kind, what form should the coordinates be for such a transformation to occur? Well, it turns out the form that we'll talk about, the coordinates we'll talk about, and the relativistic coordinates are the ones that not only allow the transformation of mechanics, but also electromagnetic theory. All right. So Einstein extended relativity. To include all laws of physics. Especially electromagnetic theory. Okay, so all laws of physics, including electricity, magnetism, and light. Okay, postural relativity. The laws of physics are the same for all for observers 
and all inertial, which means non-accelerating reference frames. No frame is singled out as preferred. Okay, that's the first postulate. The second postulate is called the postulate of the speed of light. Okay, the postulate of the speed of light. The postulate of the speed of light says the speed of light in free space is the same value C in all directions and in all inertial reference frames. So the speed of light in free space is has the same value C in all directions and in all inertial reference frames. Okay, we know C, speed of light in free space is about 200, actually it's exactly 299 million, um, 792,458 meters per second. We typically refer to it as sometimes 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Or sometimes I use 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second depending how, how precise I want to be, right? But that speed of light is the same. So you go back to my experiment, talking about, you know, if I, if I have a flashlight, if I'm on a platform going at a, at a velocity, you know, which is a good fraction of speed of light, and I turn on a flashlight, well, that flashlight should not only, I should not only see light at the speed C in my reference frame moving along at the platform, but you watching me should also see light traveling at the speed of light C. No matter what reference frame, either your stationary laboratory reference frame or me being on a, on, riding along with you know, a very, very fast along the very fast platform, everybody should measure the same value of speed of light. Now again, that is a that's a, a huge concept that Einstein thought about in his mind, but that concept required some experiment some experimental verification. Okay, so those are the two postulates of relativity. All of the entire theory of relativity depends on the truth of these two postulates. So let's talk about let's talk about some experiments. All right, so 1964. So in 1964, W. Bertosi accelerated electrons. Um, and measure their measure their speeds he also independently measured their Kinetic energy is through a calorimetric, calorimetric method. We also independently measure their kinetic energy.
through a calorimetric method, i.e. a calorimeter. What did he see? We can plot out roughly what uh, we can plot out what he got. And so we put, we have a draw a graph. Now on the uh, on the uh, vertical axis of this graph, we have the kinetic energy in MeV, mega electron volts. And let's say along the side of the graph, we'll have two MeV, four MeV, six MeV. So kinetic energy should be able to be as big as possible. Now on the on the horizontal axis, we have one, two, three. And these values are times 10 to the eighth meters per second. This would be one times 10 to the eighth, two times 10 to the eighth, three times 10 to the eighth. What he, what he discovered was that the speeds, the, the, the kinetic energies can be as large as possible, but the speeds approach an asymptote. They would not exceed the speed of light. So you can, you can have, really unlimited energy, but the speeds would not surpass the speed of light. The speed of light is the ultimate speed. You do not exceed, nothing exceeds the speed of light. So Bertosi, found, that the speed of electrons asymptotically approach the speed of light. Would never exceed it. Okay, speed of light is a limit. It is the true ultimate speed limit of the universe. Okay, so he found that he could get, in his experiment, he got electrons as fast as, so his maximum speed of an electron, in his experiment was 0 0.999999995 times the speed of light, 0 0.999. Nine 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 five C. As close as that is to the speed of light, it is not the speed of light. It is still less than the speed of light. You can you can accelerate electrons to a tremendous amount of kinetic energy, but you will never exceed the speed of light. No particle will ever, no particle with a mass will ever go the speed of light. The only particle that will go the speed of light is one that is massless. We'll talk about rest mass in a moment, like a photon. A photon has no rest mass. A photon can only exist at the speed of light. Any other particle that has a mass um, can only approach the speed of light asymptotically, never get there. So we're, look, we're looking at 99.9999999995% the speed of light but still less than the speed of light. This is the finding by W. Bertossi. In again, this is in 1964. Okay, so again, the speed of light, nothing exceeds it. That's the takeaway here. And this postulate has, the, the postulate of the speed of light being, a, there's an ultimate speed, nothing exceeds the speed of light. That uh, has been, um, that, again, that was, that, experiment um, showed very clearly this to be true. Now, another experiment, and actually the uh, same year, uh, was conducted uh, regarding the postulate of relativity. So the postulate of relativity was then tested the same year. So 1964, so here we're testing the postulate of relativity. OK, 
Okay, we need to test everything. Nature is the final arbiter of anything that we talk about in physics. Okay, so the idea was, um, and this kind of goes along with the picture that I drew earlier about, let's say, me going on a, on a very fast platform and then turning on a light source. In this case, our light source, we look at a neutral, a neutral pion. So we consider a neutral pion. And you know, we'll call it symbol pi super zero. Okay. Uh, this is an unstable uh, short-lived particle that may be produced by by a collision in particle accelerators. Okay, so this is one of these, you know, so this is an unstable short-lived particle. Now uh, we say it's short lived, does not live. I mean, again, it lives in, uh, for a very short time. And what, what happens is it, it very quickly decays into two gamma rays. So again, the pion itself is going at a tremendous velocity near the speed of light. And it decays into two, into two gamma rays. So we know a gamma ray is, electrom is, a, is part of electromagnetic spectrum. So what, what velocities it go? What well, goes at the speed of light? So we literally are turning on a, more or less a flashlight, if you will, on the reference frame of the high-speed pion. All right, and so the pion, so the neutral pion quickly decays into two gamma rays. Pi, so the pi on pi is super zero. The case into gamma plus gamma. So again, the pi on is going at a very high speed near the speed of light, and it's giving off particles that only travel at the speed of light, electromagnetic waves. Again, this is exactly like my relative velocity experiment that I was talking about. Okay, so that's that's the idea behind this experiment. So let's see what happens. So in nineteen in nineteen in the nineteen sixty four experiment. So again, still nineteen sixty four. In this 1964 experiment at CERN, which is a particle physics laboratory near Geneva. All right, um, a stream of, a beam of pions was, so a beam of pions moving at 0 0.99975C, 
very close to the speed of light. With respect to the laboratory, was generated. Okay, now these pions decayed into gamma rays. The pions quickly decayed in the, into two gamma rays as discussed. And of course, what did we want to do? Well, they they measured the speed of the gamma rays. All right, so the speed of the gamma rays was measured. The speed of the gamma rays from the moving pions was found to be B equals 2.9977 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Compare this with C, speed of light, equaling 2.9979 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Truly, we see that the gamma rays are traveling at speed light. This is within, well within experimental error, very high precision experiment within experimental error. Truly, we're seeing that the gamma rays emitted by pions moving at 0.99975 uh, C, or 0.99975 the speed of light, um, emitted gamma rays that we still measure to be at the speed of light, even though they're being emitted off of a platform that was going near the speed of light. So again, the postulate of relativity in this experiment was seen to indeed be true. Okay, so this experiment clearly demonstrated the postulate of relativity. Now, one of the things that Einstein had to look at very carefully was measurement. And again, when we talk about relativity, we're going to more or less revisit most of mechanics and more or less fix it up uh, to be correct, to be relativistically correct, as they say. And so we take nothing for granted. We need to even discuss how we measure length and time, a distance and time. Okay, even that cannot be taken for granted. All right, so we measure what is called an event. Now you see the word event, anybody who watches, you know, Discovery Channel or, you know, uh, shows that talk about black holes, or maybe you, you see Neil deGrasse Tyson or Carl Sagan or, or you know, some other, you know, some other great um, um, communicator of physics. You know, one of the things you see with black holes, you just see the mouth of a black hole, or maybe you could talk about, you know, Stephen Hawking's universe or something. The mouth of a black hole, this is a black hole, You oftentimes see the, the beginning of it called in the event horizon. Right? An event is really the measurement of something where I can where I can assign it 
three space coordinates and one time coordinate. It could be anything, all right? So again, event is, um, is a term that we use quite a bit when we talk about relativity. And more or less, it's a, it's a fairly simple concept. An event, you know, kind of like we always talk about going to an event, like a concert or something, but an event is something that happens to which an observer can assign three space coordinates and one time coordinate. So an event is something that happens. Or an observer, in relative, we always are talking about an observer, somebody observing something in a reference frame. Or an observer can assign three space coordinates and one time coordinate. Okay, so what are some examples of an event? Well, here's some examples. Uh, one example could be the turning on or off of a tiny light bulb. That could be an event. You know, when, where is light bulb and, and when does it turn on? Or when does it turn off? Uh, another example uh, could very well be the collision of two particles. Where does the collision happen? When does it happen? Uh, another example of an event could be um, the passage of a pulse of light through a specified point in space. Uh, another event could be the, the coincidence of a hand of a clock with the marker on the rim of the clock. When does the marker pass the, a certain point on the rim of the clock? Okay, so again, anything, and I can go on and on and on. Anything where I can assign um, three space and one time coordinate. Basically, where does it happen and when does it happen? So what might, what, how, how might I record such an event? Let's say the turning on of a light bulb. So let's say I have a record an event A. So I have a record. Whatever the event is, you fill in the blank. A could be the, you know, say turning on a light bulb.
what would I want to record? Well, I'd want to record three space coordinates and one time coordinate. X, Y, Z, and time. I could say, well, the light bulb's located at X equals 3.58 meters. Y equals negative 1.29 meters in some coordinate system. Z is 2.77 meters. And maybe the time is 34.5 seconds when this occurs. I assign what's called a space time coordinate. So this is a space time coordinate. The universe is on a fabric of space time. When the Big Bang happened 13.7 billion years ago, there was no time, there was no space, there was nothing. For whatever reason, we had the Big Bang and, and space time unfurled. And you cannot have time without space, you cannot have space without time. And so we live in a fabric of space time. So the universe is in a, in, on a fabric of space time. Okay, so so everything has to be assigned. We live in we live in a, you know in, in this particular case we live in a four dimensional universe. X, Y, and Z are dimensions, and so is time. Time is also a dimension. So you must be you must in relativity you must think about a space time coordinate, which is different a different way of looking at things than we have previously. Okay, now this is the thought process or the way that you have to think about assigning coordinates. We live in a four dimensional space, right? Now, one of the things to keep in mind is a given event uh, can be maybe recorded by any number of observers. And they may get they may get different numbers. They may get different values of the space time coordinate. So any number of observers in an initial reference an inertial reference frame. And they may they may disagree but they all may be right. Because again, they're, they are assigning a space-time coordinate with respect to their reference frame. Okay, so again, an event may be recorded by anybody. Anybody in the inertial reference frame may record an event. All right, and in general, Um, all such observers will assign different space time coordinates to the same event. And very important concepts. Everybody's watching the same event, but they all have a different space time set of space time coordinates to describe the same event. Why? Because they are likely all in their own inertial reference frame. Now, note, for instance, though, that no event belongs to any particular inertial reference frame. There's no special singled out reference frame that says, well, this is the correct one. 
There's no, so no event belongs to any particular reference frame. Belongs, I say, I put that in quotes and that there's not a, there's not a special reference frame. So no event belongs to any particular reference frame. As Einstein pointed out, no, no reference frame is singled out as preferred. Okay. I mean, again, um, now, basically an event is just something that happens and anyone can look at it and assign space time coordinates to it. So all, all in all, an event is just something that happens And anyone can assign space time coordinates to it. You, me, and anybody else. Anybody can play. Okay, so what we need to understand is, first of all, I talk about assigning space-time coordinates, but how do you assign space-time coordinates? What does it mean? Again, again, we're 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 asking very fundamental questions about the very measurement of things. Something, you know, we, we we may take things for granted, but. We cannot take even measuring things for granted. We have to be very, very careful about how we specify our coordinates in our, in our theory of relativity. So, so the question really is now, we need, to under, we need to understand, we need to understand how a single observer in a reference frame can assign space-time coordinates to an event. That's what we're gonna talk about now. They seem very obvious, but it's not. Okay, so we are talking about a four-dimensional space-time. And again, we're gonna use uh, Einstein's Gedanken experiment. Um, Elizabeth, turn the light on, please. Sorry. Um, we're gonna use Einstein's Gedanken experiment. And, um, and tr try to understand how we make such an, such an assignment. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a, a picture of space-time, an artist rendition. And, um, and actually before, before I do that, let me again uh, cite a, my source for a couple of pictures I'm gonna use. So again, I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures. So the pictures, are from Fundamentals of Physics, by Holiday and Resnick. Publishing company, John Wiley and Sons. Nineteen 
1988. And citing the sources, okay? So you're, I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures. They come from, basically this is one of my favorite textbooks. All right, and so the first picture uh, is referred to as the space-time jungle gym, okay? So, and I'll kind of explain what it is as we look at the picture, but it's just this, it refers to as a space-time jungle gym. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so what we see is a depiction of a four-dimensional space as best we can. Now, you look at the locations, that, I mean, you see these little clocks in various locations, right? Now, they occur at the intersection of measuring rods. Measuring rods occur along the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. It, the idea is you can measure the X, Y, Z location of any particular point uh, on, on this jungle gym based upon these measuring rods. At the intersection points of these measuring rods are little clocks. And these little clocks give you, you can, they, you can tell what the time is at a particular point. So essentially at the location of a clock, there is an X, Y, Z coordinate, and you can read off a time. So again, this is this, uh, this space-time jungle gym. So let's imagine here that I'm someplace, you know, and I, you know, let's say, you know, maybe, you know, as you're looking at this uh, jungle gym, imagine yourself looking at this jungle gym and you have, you have a little light bulb located at some location and you're going to, want to understand, you know, how, um, for instance, the passage of light from your light bulb can, you can assign space-time coordinates to any particular location where you see clocks. Now, you might think that, okay, well, the light bulb, I can, I can look at the, I can look at the light from the light bulb, I can read, you know, what the XYZ coordinate is, you know, when the light gets there, and I can look and see what the clock is. But, but one of the things you, you might want to do is say, well, let's, let's, let's assume, let's figure out how we can actually set up this jungle gym. Again, we're, this, is, this is our measuring system. All right. So what I just showed you is the space-time jungle gym. And let's kind of, uh, let's think about this very carefully. All right. So... We can imagine, and this is one of our Gedanken experiments, we can, we can imagine a space-time jungle gym as being composed of an array of measuring rods. So it's basically, uh, space time jungle gym is filled with closed pack three dimensional array of measuring rods. So closed pack three dimensional array of measuring rods. So I can make measurements in three dimensions, X, Y, and Z. Okay, so one set of rods parallel to each of the three coordinates. One set of rods 
parallel to each of the three quarters. X, Y, Z. And I'm trying to measure space. I use these, these uh, measure rods in order to be able to assign X, Y, and Z coordinates in my space time. So if the event is turning on of a small light bulb, so if the event is the turning on, of a small light bulb. For instance, the observer can only need what only needs to read the three space coordinates at the location of the light bulb. So the observer needs only to read the three the three space coordinates of the light bulb. According to this jungle trim arrangement. All right, so the event, turning on of a light bulb. Okay, so where's the light bulb? I can locate it in this XYZ coordinate system. What about the time? Okay, that's the space coordinates. Okay, that's not too bad. What about the time coordinates? Well, with the time coordinate, we we put a we can imagine that there's a clock at the intersection of the array of measure rods, right? So for the time coordinate, we can imagine a little clock. At the intersection of um, of the of uh, of the three rods of the of um, any three coordinate rods. So three perpendicular coordinate rods, or three perpendicular coordinate measuring rods. Okay, so put a clock there and the observer can read the light generated by the event. So the observer can read the clock by the light measure by the light from the event. So again, we're turning on the light bulb. The light allows me to read the clock. All right. Now, we have to synchronize the clocks, though. All right. So that's one of the problems that you have with, with clocks is they all have to be telling the right time. So we need to synchronize. The array of clocks. Well, 
how might we do this? Well, one thing we might be able to do is say, we'll just gather up all the clocks in one place, set them at the right time, and then carry the clocks over to the various locations and set them up on the rod, on, on, the, on the various intersection points. But we have to question everything. How do we not know that moving the clocks may not, may not change the rates of time? Actually, moving the clocks will change the rates of time. So we really can't do that. We have to actually set the clocks in the positions first and then synchronize them. Moving clocks will find run slow. All right, so the very, the very process of moving the clock slows down this rate of time so we can't so we can't you know again one of the things we have to do is we have to question everything and so we have we can't just say well let's just synchronize all the clocks in one place and then just carry them to different places you can't do that all right and so synchronize the clocks again you might think well let's just synchronize them in one place and then carry them so Again, we may want to so we, may, we may want to uh, synchronize all the clocks in one place. and then carry them to their locations on the on the space time jungle gym. However, we are committed to question everything, okay? So, however, we are committed to question everything. For instance, how do we know that moving the clocks doesn't change doesn't change the rate of time? It actually does. So, for example, for instance, how do we know that moving the clocks Does, uh, uh, does not affect their rate of time. In fact, moving clocks do run slower. You can't do this. You can't just synchronize them all in one place and then carry them different parts of the of the uh, of the jungle gym. Again, what that does is that that desynchronizes them. All right. So what you have to do is you have to place them all in their in in, in their location in the jungle gym, and then you have to employ enlist a group of helpers little helpers who are going to stand there next to the clocks and then you say okay i'm going to turn on my light bulb and i'm going to declare that as t equals zero then as the helper as a given helper next to one of the clocks sees the light that helper 
knows that what the distance between the light bulb and his or her location is, that we call R, the helper will then set the time of the clock to R divided by C, whatever that particular R is. So that way the, the, all the clocks will be synchronized because they'll all see the, the light at the same time. You declare, when you, when you turn on your light, you declare that's T equals zero. And each of the helpers has his or her own R, which is the, you know, the basic distance from the light bulb to their location where their clock is, and they will set their clock to R divided by C. Okay, so all of them will be synchronized but you must enlist a group of helpers to synchronize the clocks as um, basically right as soon as the event happens, okay? And again, that's important because let's say for instance, the, the experiment was, let's say I can imagine turning on the sun. Let's say the sun is off and it's a giant light bulb and I turn it on, big giant light bulb I call the sun. Well, I might see the sun right there. I say, okay, that's T equals zero. Well, if I look at a distance R, let's say being the Earth-Sun distance, an observer on Earth is not going to see that light for 8.3 minutes. So the observer would then say, oh, I see the light. I set it to R over C. That's what you have to do. You have to allow for the passage of time because the speed of light is finite. If the speed of light was infinite, I can have all the helpers, everybody can set their clock said zero at the same time, but the speed of light is not infinite. There's no such thing as an infinitely, infinitely fast signal. We have to pick the fastest signal possible, that's the speed of light. And we have to do what's called retard the time based upon that distance. Okay, so my synchronization is not as simple as it may seem. So what do I have to do? Again, let me write it down. <clears throat> we need to place the unsynchronized clocks At their, at their respective locations on the space time jungle gym. Okay. Number one, put all the clocks where they are. Don't worry about synchronizing them. Doesn't do any good anyway. Now, we enlist a group of helpers. Whose job is to stand next to a given clock and synchronize. Okay, need to get some helpers. Now, each helper knows the distance R from his or her clock to the light bulb that will be lit.
That's the event. Okay, now, I turn on the light bulb. and declare the time as t equals zero. I say, I, I'm, I'm doing the event, I'm turning on the light bulb, t equals zero. As the light passes each observer, each observer or each uh, helper, each helper is gonna set his or her clock to R over C. All right, as the light reaches each observer, he or she will set their clock to R over C. We have to allow for the passage of light, which is a finite speed. At this, doing so will truly synchronize all the clocks on my space-time jungle gym. Okay, and so the we we look at the concept now of simultaneity at this point. So now we very carefully have uh, laid out how you, how the, um, an event is recorded in space-time. Okay, so an event, uh, it, again, an event has a certain X, Y, Z, which is fairly easy to measure. That, that's measured by the measuring rods. And then the clocks in space-time, depending on where, you know where in space time you are the event is measured at different locations based upon you know again the location you know the the xyz the location but also the passage of time time has to be synchronized in this manner so the next concept we want to talk about is simultaneity now Simultaneity means, you know, when we have things that are simultaneous, things that appear to us to occur at the same time. It turns out that simultaneity is a relative concept, not an absolute concept. What is simultaneous to me in my reference frame will generally not be simultaneous to somebody else in his or her reference frame. Simultaneity, now granted, given the speed of light is so fast, in our regular life, you know, I something that appears simultaneous to me, standing, let's say, on a sidewalk, will generally more or less appear simultaneous to somebody else they driving in their car. Both of us are going, I mean, I'm I'm standing still. I'm at rest in my reference frame. The car is at what, 50 miles per hour or whatever. That's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the speed of light. And certainly nowhere near relativistic. And so in, in, in our regular experience, the person riding in a 50 mile an hour car and me standing on a sidewalk, we're gonna more or less think that the two events are simultaneous, but in general, they really are not. All right. So let's let's let me show you a uh, a, a picture here. Okay. Now let me uh, share my screen. And this picture also came out of Holiday and Resnick. Okay, 
Now I'm going to introduce a couple of characters. A per one named Sally and one named Sam. Sally, I mean, you see in this picture here, you know, you can kind of see the female symbol next to her and the male symbol next to Sam. Sally is, so Sam is on a stationary platform. So you look at, at picture A, Sam is stationary. They're both on two very long spaceships. Sam is, we'll, we'll consider as stationary. Sally is moving such that her ship is parallel to Sam's, but she is moving at a constant velocity V. Now, two meteorites are gonna strike their ships. Their ships are fairly close together and one meteorite is going to give off a red explosion, red light, and it's going to make a red mark. And the other one, that's on the right-hand side in our picture. And the other is going to leave a blue mark, and it's going to give off a blue wave. So they both make, so they both explode and make marks on the ships at the same time. And generally speaking, we often do in relativity is we assigned prime coordinates. We put a prime on the coordinates. And I, and I apologize for the warping here. I, I copied off of a page in the textbook here, but uh, we assign prime coordinates to moving coordinates. And we consider the stationary coordinates as unprimed. So we see that Sally experiences events R prime and B prime. And Sam experiences events R and B, R standing for red, B standing for blue. Now, let's look at picture C. Sam, turns out that for Sam, the blue wave and the red wave, the, the blue pulse and red pulse coincide for him. They occur seemingly at the same time. The waves coincide right where he is. Now, after this event, Sam looks afterwards, he sees the blue mark and the red mark in his space and says, well, I'm exactly midway between the two marks. And the waves, the pulse for each of the marks, the blue wave and the blue pulse and the red pulse uh, coincided at my location. I declare that these events were simultaneous. Sally, on the other hand, is moving toward the red event. She's moving at a velocity V. So if you take a look at picture B for Sally, she's gonna see the red wave, the red pulse before the blue pulse, because she's moving at a velocity V toward the red event. She will see, so she will see the red pulse before the blue pulse. Later on, she also measures and says, yes, I also was midway between the two marks. I have a red mark and a blue mark on my spaceship. And I'm also right in between, midway between the two marks. However, I experienced the red pulse before the blue pulse. And I do not think that the events were simultaneous. They were not simultaneous for me. So Sam says the events are simultaneous for him. Sally says the, the events are not simultaneous for her. They disagree. And yet they're both correct. Why? Because Sally is in a different reference frame than Sam. Sally is measuring all of her coordinates in a reference frame that's moving at a velocity V toward the red event. Whereas Sam is stationary. They disagree. And yet both of them are correct. Simultaneity, things appearing simultaneous, is a relative concept, not an absolute concept. Okay, so let me write down what I, what I just said, more or less. Okay, so to put together what I said, is, again, we're talking about the concept of simultaneity.
So we have two spaceships. Again, as I said, two, a long, two long spaceships. All right, here is one spaceship. And here's another. So, so we have one spaceship, long spaceship, and right alongside parallel is another one. Now, again, um, we have Sam. Sam is sitting at one. We'll use the symbol, the male symbol for him, Sam. Sally is sitting on the other. Use the female symbol for her. Okay, Sally is moving to the right at a speed V with respect to Sam. She is moving parallel to Sam. Now, they're moving, they're close together and these explosions happen, bang, they, they happen. And here we see on one side, uh, the blue is on the left and the red is on the right. So let me make these a little bit longer. Bang, bang, okay. So Sally's coordinates, she's moving, we call hers B prime. So B for blue prime. And Sam, we have just B. For uh, Sally's, her red coordinate is R prime. Sam's is R. Sally is moving at a, at a velocity B, constant velocity B with respect to Sam moving to the right. So again, Sam is at the midpoint, as he says, and he's seeing the red wave and the blue wave coinciding where he is. Okay, so again, these waves happen. Here's, here's the red wave and here's the blue wave. I guess I should probably have color pens for this, but again, they're, they're coinciding for Sam. However, Sally sees, because Sally is moving toward the red wave, she sees red wave first, right? So again, Sam, Sam experiences, or the red, the red, the, the pulse from the red explosion and the blue explosion occurs uh, at, at the same, they coincide for Sam. Sam later determines that he was standing at the midpoint between these two explosions by looking at the marks on his spaceship. Say the two meteorite collisions is what these are. Meteorite. By looking at, by measuring where he was standing. with respect to the blue and red marks on the spaceship. Okay, Sam declares that the two events were simultaneous for him. Okay, Sam declares that 
an event red, and event blue. simultaneous for him. Okay, he says, yeah, these are simultaneous events. What about Sally? Okay, so Sally, moves at constant velocity V toward the red events. She sees the red pulse before the blue pulse. So Sally experiences the red pulse before the blue pulse. Sally also says that she was standing at the midpoint of these of the of the two events as well. So Sally also finds that she was standing between the two events. She was standing at the midpoint between events red and blue. Judge uh, based upon the marks on her spaceship. Sally declares that the events were not simultaneous. Sally and Sam disagree. Yet neither one of them is wrong. They're they're both right. Again, simult simultaneity is a relative concept. Okay, so they may disagree, but that's because they're on different reference frames. All right. So it turns out they're both right. <clears throat> so Sally and Sam. Disagree regarding simultaneity. Which is because simultaneity is a relative, not an absolute concept. They are both correct. Because they're on different reference frames. Or 
different inertial reference frames. And very important concepts. Okay, so simultaneity is one of these complications of measuring time. All right, and so again, it's unfamiliar to us simply because you know we don't we don't we travel at such small low speeds that we do not we do not see this complication of simultaneity. But truly, but truly, it is um, it is something that is um, very much experienced at higher speeds. You know, it's very important. Now, simultaneity leads into the concept of time. Okay, it's very close related to time. So again, Einstein, as the story goes, he was there was a outside the Swiss Patent Office was this big clock. It's big, almost like a Big Ben kind of a clock. And he would stare at this clock all the time and think about time. He would think about simultaneity. He would watch the hands of the clock and think about simultaneity as he's bored at the patent office. And so some of these ideas occurred, maybe many other people would probably be totally bored, but Einstein was conceptualizing the, some of the great ideas of relativity. So with the simultaneity, we lead ourselves now into the concept of time, all right? We're gonna talk about the relativity of time, something that you might take for granted, but there's nothing, there's nothing simple about time. So we're gonna next talk about time. Again, we're revisiting mechanics and we're literally very carefully revisiting every single concept to make sure we have it absolutely right. So again, relativity of time. Okay. So we're not studying simultaneity for no reason. The relativity of simultaneity is closely related to the relativity of time. I kind of leap from one concept to the other. Relativity of simultaneity is closely related to the relativity of time. So essentially, instead of, instead of talking about the, the simultaneity of one event, we're going to look about, we're going to talk about really the measurement of two events and the time duration between two events. And what we're going to find out is that one observer on one reference frame will measure that time duration differently than another observer. They will not agree on the duration of time between two events either. Okay, so basically different observers So different observers um, will measure um, in, in, in um, different inertial reference frames will measure different time durations between two events. They will not agree with on that either. All 
all right? So that's where we get into the concept of time, how much time is elapsed. So we're gonna go back to our friends, uh, Sam and Sally. And one thing I wanna point out, by the way, and I forgot to do so on regarding simultaneity, is that, remember and I told you that Sam experienced event red and event blue to be simultaneous and Sally did not. I could have had a little different uh, situation occur. Maybe Sally was the one who experienced the simultaneity of the events and Sam did not. It turns out that, that either one of them could have, could have been the person who had the simultaneous event. It turns out that, that there is a, there is a, um, a, a symmetry involved with this. So again, if we go back to simultaneity, Looking back at simultaneity, and I forgot to mention this. Recall that event red and event blue. We're simultaneous for Sam, but not for Sally. By symmetry, it could have just, it could have, it could well have been. That event red and blue, event red and event blue were simultaneous for Sally and not Sam. There's nothing special. I just, I just picked a situation where they were simultaneous for Sam and not for Sally. It could have been Sally and not Sam. It would work just perfectly well. Now I'm gonna discuss a situation where we don't have that symmetry. And that's the relativity of time. So, so let's, let's um, again, I just wanna point this out. Now there's nothing particularly special about the simultaneity for Sam. I mean, again, they, they're going to disagree. If one finds a simultaneous, the other will not. So it could very well be that in my example that Sam found the events to be simultaneous and Sally did not. Well, I could have constructed the example just as well with the, with the colliding meteorites such that Sally found the events to be simultaneous and Sam did not. Okay, so again, there's, you know, I, I could go either way. All right, so there's a, there's a, there is a symmetry of the situation. Okay, depending on how I look at it. Now, let us now consider, we're going to consider that Sally is riding on a train. Uh, moving at velocity V. So she's moving at a constant velocity V. Uh, with respect to a stationary platform. On which sand stands. Okay, so Sally is moving on a train. 
at a velocity B with respect to SAM. SAM is stationary on a platform. Now SAM is what, so Sally is going to do an experiment, okay? So we're gonna take a look at what Sally sees, okay? So Sally has a light bulb and the ceiling of the train car, there is a mirror, okay? So let's look at, let's look at, at Sally. Let's watch Sally. So Sal, we're gonna ride along with Sally right now. In her train car, so she has a bulb, B. She has a bulb, B. On the ceiling is a mirror. Okay, so she has a mirror on the ceiling of the train car. She's gonna, basically she's gonna have two events. Event one. Okay, event one is the turning on of the flash bulb B. Okay, that's event one, light emitting, emitting from a flash from the bulb. Event two, okay, and that's something that we can assign three space and one time coordinate to. Event two will be the arrival of light back at the source after reflection from a mirror in the ceiling. Okay, so event two will be the arrival of the light um, back at its source after reflection off the mirror on the ceiling. Okay, so what's that? Let's, let's imagine here for a moment that this distance between the ceiling and the bulb is D, capital D. What is Sally going to see? Well, she's going to see event one. The light's going to come, oops, the light is going to come from the bulb up to the mirror and then back to where it came, okay? So this is event one. This is event two. All right. Want to find out, you know, how long that, e that took, right? And so, well, so again, event one is, the light leaving the bulb, the flash bulb, and then and then the, what's the light going to do? It's going to go to, up toward the mirror and the ceiling. And this is a mirror. This is the mirror on the ceiling. It's going to bounce. It's going to reflect off the mirror and go back to the bulb. All right. And so, how long did that take? Sally will say that it's the time it took to go a distance of 2D. So Sally is gonna say that that distance was, she's gonna say, oh, that, that delta time, I'm gonna call it delta T naught, is gonna be 2D over C. She will say that that's how long that took. Basically the, the time it took to go at the speed of light, because it's light, bounce, basically back and forth a distance D. So it'll be two times D. 2D over C would be how long that took. So Sally, I'm gonna put a little, I'll explain why I'm putting a little O here in a moment. The delta T naught is 2D over C. That is from Sally. 
What does Sam see? Let's go take a look at what Sam, so Sam's watching Sally. I go, Sally, her equation is 2D over C. Sam is gonna see, initially, as he's watching Sally, he's gonna see the bulb B initially. So here's event one happening. But what he's gonna see now, let's see if I can draw this nicely. Okay, in between is where the mirror is. That's the mirror. That's the mirror. Okay, so light. This is what Sam sees. Sam sees the light coming from the bulb, bouncing off the mirror, and then coming back to this bulb. So here's the mirror. Okay, this is event one. This coming back to the bulb again is event two. Remember, he is on the platform. He is watching Sally. Okay. So the platform is going at a, at a speed V. So this distance is V delta T. Sam is gonna measure the distance V delta T. Again, his coordinate is gonna, I'm getting Sally's coordinate, I'm marking her coordinate with a little little O, delta T naught. I'm not marking Sam. Sam's coordinate is not gonna have the little O on the end. So again, I say delta, I'll explain why that is in a moment. So Sam is gonna have a different coordinate. Again, we're talking about relativity of time. Sam is gonna be measuring a different set of coordinates for himself than Sally is. Now, let's do a little trigonometry here, a little, I'm sorry, a little Pythagorean theorem here. This distance, this height is D. Sam is gonna say, well, this, I measured this distance to be L along this hypotenuse. And I have, again, it's going to go L back. So Sam says, well, I measure, this is what Sam says. Sam says, well, I measure delta T to be 2L over C. That's Sam. Sam is looking at the light, and from his perspective on the platform, on the tissue platform, the light is going up, striking the mirror, again, the train is constantly moving, and it comes back. So by the time it gets to the bulb, where's the bulb? Well, the bulb is, it has moved down the platform by an amount V delta T. That's what Sam sees. So Sally has an equation and Sam has an equation. Now, it turns out that Sally's particular time interval is special. Sally's time interval is called the proper time. So Sally uh, makes, so Sally uh, makes her measurement with a single clock at a single location. Nobody else can say that but her. So she makes her measurement with a single clock at a single location. So Sally makes a measurement in the rest frame of the event, or in the rest frame of in, in, in the in the rest frame, if you will. She's she's riding along with the experiment. She doesn't have to move.
This is called the proper time. Delta T naught. It's a special reference frame or special way of measuring such that you only have to use one clock and one location. Sally did not have to move. She sat still and did her measurement. She used one clock, she used one location. When you do that, your measure is called the proper time. So her, her, her particular time is very special. It's the proper time. Nobody else is gonna measure the proper time, including Sam. He will not measure the proper time at all. It turns out that we're, we're gonna find out that anybody else will measure a time longer than the proper time. Well, let's try to figure out what is Sam's time compared with Sally's time, all right? So first of all, let's look at this triangle and let's kind of do, do some Pythagorean theorem. So first of all, we can say that this triangle, I'm gonna look at the one of the triangles, or maybe this left, this left right triangle here. And I would say that L, so by the Pythagorean theorem, I will say that L is equal to what? The square root of, of this length, this length squared plus this length squared, okay? This particular length is one half B delta T. So it's gonna be a square root of one half B delta T, all of this squared plus this length squared, D squared. Square roots. Okay, so again, the relation of these lengths, L is a square root of half of this length squared, or one half B delta T quantity squared, plus this length squared, D squared. Now, we can say is we can take Sally's equation and eliminate D. So we can actually take Sally's equation and solve for D. So looking at Sally's equation, we can write that D is equal to one half C delta T, delta T naught. Okay, I will take Sally's equation, expression for D, and I'll substitute it for D here. So instead of having D squared, I can then say, well, instead I'll have one half C delta T naught, quantity squared. So I'll write that L is equal to the square root of one half V delta T in all of this squared plus Sally's expression, one half C delta T naught squared. All I've done is I've substitute for Sally's expression and then i also know well sam has an expression too i can actually use sam's equation and solve for l so using sam's equation i can say well i know that l is um one half uh, is one half c delta t So let's put that in here for L. So instead of L, I can write that I have one half C delta T instead of L is equal to the square root of one half B delta T quantity squared plus one half C delta T naught quantity squared, all right? So I think we're done with this picture. 
I need real estate. So I'm going to erase this picture and continue the algebra up here now. <clears throat> so let's erase. I, I've also used the Sam and Sally equations. I'm going to erase those now too. I've used them for what they're worth. So what we have here is this equation is the important equation. I'm going to square both sides of this equation. I square the left side. Squaring the right side is just going to undo the, the square root, right? So I'm going to take this and bring it on up here now. And so squaring both sides, I have one fourth. Uh, well, actually, let's, let's just say I have, yeah, I have one fourth C delta T quantity squared. Or right, well, let's just do this. One fourth C squared delta T squared. Okay, and then squaring the right-hand side just gets rid of the square root, all right? And so I get that's equal to one-fourth, and I'm just squaring this out. B squared delta T quantity squared. Again, a square of a product is a product of the squares. And over here, one-fourth C squared delta T not squared. Let's get rid of the one fourths. Cancel all the one fourths out. All right. Now, what am I after? I'm after trying to express delta t in terms of delta t naught. So let's throw all the delta t on one side. So I have c squared delta t quantity squared minus throwing on the other side v squared delta t quantity squared equals C squared delta T naught quantity squared. Let's factor out the delta T squared on the left-hand side. I have C squared minus B squared. Times delta T quantity squared is C squared delta T naught squared. And I'm going to divide everything through by C squared. So I divide by C squared. That becomes a one. This becomes a B squared over C squared. This C squared goes away. All right. So again, divide through by C squared. Speed of light squared. I get one minus B squared over C squared. times delta T quantity squared equals delta T naught quantity squared. Now, I'm going to divide by this parentheses and take the square root of both sides. What I find out is that delta T is delta T naught divided by the square root of one minus B squared over C squared. All right, so this is the relationship between Sam's coordinate, his time duration delta T, and that of the proper time, which is Sally's coordinate. Again, what did I do again? I went Pythagorean theorem from that picture. I substituted for Sally's equation. And I substitute for Sam's equation here, and the rest of it's just algebra. Okay, and so there's a relationship between their time durations. Just kind of write it out here. So it's Sam, his time duration is delta t. Sally's time duration is delta t naught the proper time divided by the square root of one minus B squared over C squared. Again, delta T naught is the proper time.
That's the time in the reference frame where you only have to use one clock and one location, just like Sally did with her bulb. Okay, now let's look at this a little more carefully. We're gonna define what is called the speed parameter. Uh, actually, let me, let me let me say one more thing. Sally's time was the proper time because she can actually just use one clock and one location. Nobody else can do that, right? So again, Sally, the delta T not is the proper time. Since Sally needed just one clock at one location where she was sitting on the train. Sam, delta T, uh, to measure delta T, Sam required two synchronized clocks uh, located at the position of event one and event two, respectively. He needs two clocks that are synchronized. And any other person trying to measure the event of, of, the, of the light going from the, from the bulb to the mirror and back, any other person other than Sally would also have the same issue would also have to use, would have, to, would have to measure delta T requiring two synchronized clocks, not one, but two, and two locations. Two synchronized clocks, two locations. Sally only needs one clock and one location. So again, Sam, so he, he's, he's gonna have two positions, position of event one, and position of event two. Anybody else is gonna have that. So anybody else's time is not the proper time. Now. Let's look at this equation a little more carefully. Let's define what is called the speed parameter. So let beta, which equals V over C, be the speed parameter. Okay, so it's nothing but a ratio. It is unitless, right? V divided by C is a speed over a speed, a meter per second or a meter per second, unitless, right? So what I can do then is I can say, well, delta T is then delta T naught divided by the square root of one minus beta squared. I can write it like this. This is one way of writing the equation. There's another way of writing. And there's a third way. I define what's called the Lorentz factor. Delta T, we're going to say is gamma. Delta T naught. Gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus V over C quantity squared. Square root of that. Or you can write it as one over the square root of one minus beta squared. Now, beta for very, very, you know, for pretty much anything that we measure macroscopically, even hypersonic aircraft, beta is very, very small. So generally speaking, 
gamma is almost always one for us. Beta, you know, any, any, even a hypersonic aircraft, B divided by C is going to be minuscule, even for something as fast as a, as a hypersonic aircraft. For us, we do not, it, we do not see relativity easily for macro, in a macroscopic world. That's why it's unfamiliar to us. And so generally speaking, gamma is usually one in our life. But for things that are approaching relativistic speeds or where you have to start worrying about relativity, gamma becomes a number bigger than one. So if you imagine any V over C that some fraction, one minus that is gonna be some number that's less than one. One divided by a number less than one is gonna be a bigger number. That means that gamma is always greater than or equal to one. Or gamma is generally greater than one. So gamma, is generally greater than one. Again, this gamma is called the Lorentz factor. Named after Henri Antoine Lorentz. He's a Dutch physicist. Nobel laureate physicist, brilliant physicist, personal friend of Albert Einstein's, lived around the late 1800s or into the 1900s. Lorentz made great contributions to electromagnetic theory, to relativity, and to quantum theory. Uh, you know, you hear about the Lorentz force law. We talk about electro electromagnetic theory. That's the same Lorentz a highly accomplished, brilliant physicist. And so you see his name on relativity as well. Okay, the Lorentz factor is always greater than one, which means that delta T is greater than delta T naught. Any time that you measure that's not the proper time interval, any time that you, any other interval is going to be greater than the proper time interval. We refer to this as time dilation. Dilate, the dilate means a stretch. Time dilation. Meaning that the shortest time duration is a time duration where you are moving along with the, with the event, like Sally is. Sam is gonna measure a time duration that is longer than that of Sally's. To him, the experiment is gonna seem slower as he's watching Sally. Sally's time and duration will be a delta T naught. Sam's time duration will be some delta T that's greater than delta T naught. Okay, so time dilation is very real. We have verified it experimentally. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. So again, delta T naught is a proper time. That's the time duration between two events, event one and event two, as you are moving along with, that e with those events. You only need one location and one clock. Anybody else is going to measure a larger delta T. And again, that person is going, to, is going to observe you or observe the event moving with respect, to, with respect to him or her at a velocity V. So again, like just like in Sally, Sally was moving at a velocity V with respect to Sam. The reference frame of Sally or reference frame of the event is moving at a velocity V with respect to the observer. The observer is going to measure a larger delta T given by this relationship. Again, this is called time dilation. I have, I have, I have introduced a, what's called the speed parameter. I've also introduced what's called the Lorentz factor. Lorentz factor is a number that's always greater than one. And that means that delta T is always greater than delta T naught. Any time you measure that's not the proper time duration is going to be longer than the proper time. Now we have, we have, a, of course, this is a, a crazy zany kind of a result. And so of course you want to, you want to test this result. 
All right. So again, this this particular situation has been tested. So I'm going to talk about a number of tests now regarding time dilation. So one test would be, you know, we have these particles called muons or mu mesons actually. Mu mesons are emitted from the sun. So they travel at about 99.7% the speed of light. So again, mu mesons. are emitted, are particles, short-lived particles, emitted from the sun. and they rain onto the earth. Okay, they travel at about 99.7% the, or say 99.3% the speed of light. So they travel very, very fast. Now, uh, mu mesons have a very short half life. Half life is you have a set of mu mesons, is the time it takes for half of them to decay. Talk about half life more in chapter 31, but short half-life, which is the time that half of them will decay, half of them will go away. These half-lives are measured in a laboratory. So we get on top of a mountain, top of a tall mountain. And we set ourselves up near the peak of the mountain. We, and we, uh, we measure how many mu mesons we see. All right, so we detect mu mesons. Now, if relativity was not true, then we would, we, would, we would see almost no mu mesons reach the bottom of the mountain. But relativity says what? Relativity says that if delta T naught is the half-life, is the proper half-life of a meson, mu meson, we should observe an extended life. Delta T. We should observe a, long, a life that's longer. How much longer? Delta T is delta T naught over one minus beta squared. Beta is 0.993. Okay, so again, what's the events? You know, it, observing it and then dying, right? 
you know, basically life and death. I mean, those are the events. I mean, the, the lifetime of the meson. That's the event. We would call that delta T naught as measured, in, let's say, in the laboratory frame. It's measuring a frame where, where the meson is at rest. It's proper, true half-life. If this thing is if this thing is going at some crazy velocity of 0.993 the speed of light, we would expect the time its life as we're observing it to greatly slow down if relativity is true. And so when we do the measurement and we measure, we detect new mesons at the bottom of the mountain, almost all of them arrive. Their clocks, their, their internal clocks have been so slowed down as we observe them that almost all of them survive the trip from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the mountain. This would not happen if relativity were not true. If there was no such thing as time dilation, this would not happen. So the very fact that we can detect almost all mesons Again, we can detect almost all mu mesons at the bottom of the mountain, right here. The fact that we can detect almost all of them means that their clocks have been greatly, greatly slowed down because of time dilation. So here's a Again, this, this, this experiment has been done multiple times. Uh, here's another experiment with, me, with mu mesons or muons um, at the CERN. I talked about CERN earlier. So, it, so again, I talked about a couple of experiments that occurred in 1964. Let's talk about an experiment that occurred in 1968 at CERN. So, um, in 1968, four years later, um, an, exper an, ex an experiment ex uh, um, at CERN, there's a beam of muons that's circulated in a storage ring, 25 meter radius, and is accelerated to 0.9966 C. So, at CERN, A beam of muons um, circulated uh, was circulated in a storage ring of radius twenty five meters. at a speed of 0 0.9966 C. Okay, now the average lifetime, so the lifetime of a muon as measured in a frame, in a reference frame where it is at rest called a rest frame. is delta T naught, again, it's measured at, in a frame which that's at rest, that would be its proper time, right? Delta T naught is, has been measured to be 2.200 microsecond. So at this speed, what do we expect? What do we expect the, uh, what do we expect the lifetime to be? So at, 
B equals 0 0.9966 C, we expect time dilation to increase the lifetime of the meson. The muons. Okay, well, what what would we expect? Well, we would expect delta T to be gamma delta T naught. All right, we would expect delta T to be the square root of or delta T naught. divided by the square root of one minus beta squared, or we would expect delta T to be delta T naught, which is 2.200 microseconds, divided by one minus, again, the parameter 0 0.9966, remember that's just a speed parameter, You gotta make sure you square that. Put in the square root. We expect a lifetime of um, 20, well, we, we expect a lifetime of 26.7 microseconds. That's what we expect for these muons that are going at this very, this very large speed. What was measured? The measured value, the measured lifetime of these high speed muons was delta T is 26.2 microseconds. within experimental uncertainty. So we agree. The lifetime of these muons was truly expanded because we are watching them at, in a reference frame that is moving at a very high speed relative to us. Now that's, that's time dilation measured with microscopic clocks. Um, we also had some experiments where time dilation was measured with macroscopic clocks, all right? So again, this was done at, you know, this, this experiment here, as I talked about, was done in 1968 at CERN. Now, we had um, another one, kind of a little bit of a crazy experiment here, and I'm gonna talk about now. So in October, nineteen seventy seven, October nineteen seventy seven, Joseph Pathel. And Richard Keating uh, boarded airlines, so they they carried an at uh, atomic clock. on airlines. and flew the clocks around the world. Okay, crazy experiment. Um, their purpose 
as they said, was to test Einstein's theory of relativity with macroscopic clocks. So their purpose. Somebody funded them to do this. Was to test Einstein's theory of relativity. with macroscopic clocks. All right, so that's what they did. They found that, Hafel and Keating found that they were able to agree with Einstein's predictions within five to 10%. Okay, so in so doing, Hapel and Keating found that uh, they agreed with Einstein's predictions within five to 10%. I mean, again, we're talking about a, an extremely rough experiment, you know, you're not just flying at a constant speed, you know, you're boarding one airplane to another, you're carrying it around, you're walking, you're climbing stairs. I mean, who knows what all, all you're doing, right? And so again, but they're able to move the clock around and they're able to see that they agreed within 500% of Einstein's uh, theory. Um, one of the things, you know, one thing they neglected, so one effect that was neglected was that time, at, the rate of time actually is affected by gravity, right? So one effect that was neglected is Einstein's general theory of relativity. So one, one, so one effect that was neglected was that Einstein's general theory of relativity states that the rate of time rates are affected by gravity. Shows that time rates are affected by gravity. They did not account for this. Okay. Okay, so an improved experiment occurred a few years later. Okay, so this is Havel and Keating, 1977. A few years later, we had an improved experiment with macroscopic clocks. So a few years later, An improved experiment was conducted with macroscopic clocks. Okay, so I think probably anything would be an improvement over Hefel and Keating's experiment. Uh, so um, physicists at the University of Maryland the 
physicist at the University of Maryland. Um, blue atomic clocks um, round and round over Chesapeake Bay. Fifteen hour durations. Okay, and they were able to agree with Einstein's predictions, but then one percent. So they were able to agree. with Einstein's time dilation predictions within 1%. <clears throat> So again, much much uh, improved experiment. Okay, so we see that moving clocks run slow. That's the long and short of it. Time dilation says that the, the um, passage of time, the ticking of time for a moving clock is slower than for a stationary clock. All right, so essentially moving clocks run slow. What that means is the ticking of the the ticking of time. For a moving clock. is slower than for a stationary clock. I mean, that is what time dilation tells you. Time dilation is a real phenomenon. So with time dilation, one of the, uh, Things you'll read about or hear about in the popular literature is what's called the twin paradox. So the twin paradox, basically, I'll write this down in a moment here. Imagine that you have two identical twin sisters. Okay, so one sister stays at home on the earth. And the other sister gets on a spaceship and she travels at toward a distant star at an appreciable speed or appreciable fraction of the speed of light. She goes all the way out to some distant star and she comes back. Now, her stay at home sister will observe her, let's imagine. And to the stay at home sister, the traveling twin looks like every one of her processes are very, very slowed down. She's going at a speed, an appreciable fraction of the speed of light. So her heart rate is slow. Her respiratory rate is slow. Her aging process is slow. Now to the twin, to the traveling twin, she looks at herself for all her processes and everything seems normal to her. So she goes off to the distant star and she comes back. And she comes back and she comes back to a sister who is older than her. It could very well be that her sister is elderly and she's hardly aged at all. It could very well be that she does, she comes back and her sister has long since passed away and maybe she comes back to her sister's grandchildren. 
her to to her to traveling twin everything seems normal but to the earthbound twin watching her the traveling twins because of time dilation the traveling twin everything about the traveling twin every, all of her processes her heart rate her aging everything is greatly slowed okay and so this is now this is beginning and I'll, I'll, now i haven't discussed what the actual paradox is yet but let's let me kind of write down what i just said so again what i'm discussing here is called the twin paradox okay very interesting concept and i'll make a movie reference here to it in a moment we talk about what's called the twin paradox Okay, what's it about? Consider two sisters, two sisters who are identical twins. One sister stays at home. On earth. And the other sister. Travels. To a distant star. and back at a speed that is an appreciable fraction of the speed of light. And the stay-at-home sister to the stay-at-home sister the heart rate Respiratory rate and the overall aging process. Of the traveling twin is greatly slowed. because of time dilation. Okay, so stay at home sister witnesses the traveling sister as being very, very slow now. All of her processes, even her aging is slow. Now, to the traveling twin, all of her processes are normal. All right, so to the traveling twin,
all of her processes are normal. She's fine. When the traveling twin Returns home, returns back to Earth. She will meet her elderly sister. Or maybe even her sister's grandchildren. Her sister may have long since passed. More of a sad story. Okay, so again, this is because of time dilation. Nothing else. It's time dilation. It's it's a it's an effect of relativity. Here's where the paradox comes into play. The paradox is, let's say that, remember when we talked about Sam and Sally on the moving spaceships with the meteorites exploding? Well, remember I told you that that was a symmetrical situation. It could have been Sam who saw the simultaneous red and blue pulse, or it could have been Sally. Symmetry does not work here. And the paradox is, let's say this, the traveling twin says, wait a minute, what if I regard myself as stationary and my sister as traveling, and my, or my sister as the one who is moving at the speed, at the high speed? So when I return home, if that's the case, might I, might my sister, might I be older than my sister instead of the other way around? That's the paradox. Why, why is that not true? Okay, so, the, 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 so the, the paradox is, here's the paradox. The paradox is the following. I guess for those who understand relativity, it's not a paradox at all. But here it is. The paradox is as follows. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the traveling twin might say, Okay, traveling could say, can I not regard myself as a stationary and my earthbound sister as traveling? So can I not regard myself as stationary? And my earthbound sister as traveling? If so, she should be younger than I when we meet and not the other way around. If so, she should be younger than I. When we meet, not the other way around. Why is that not so?
Okay. So again, the paradox is the traveling twin could say, can I not regard myself as stationary and my earthbound sister as traveling? If so, she should be younger than I when we meet and not the other way around. Well, the problem with that logic is that if this twin is to actually come home, she must perform a necessary acceleration. She must basically stop, decelerate, turn around, and accelerate back to her high speed to come home. At some point, there's a noticeable point in which she must accelerate. It basically, she needs to change reference frames. She needs to move off of a off of an outward outbound reference frame to an inbound reference frame. Her sister at home does not have to do that. There is a distinct difference between the traveling twin and her earthbound sister. Her earthbound sister does not exchange reference frames. The traveling twin must. That's the mistake here in her logic is that her situation is definitely distinctly different than her sister's. Hence the solution to the paradox. So it is the traveling twin who's younger and not her earthbound sister. Okay, so again, kind of put this in writing here. If the traveling twin is to return home, She must perform necessary accelerations to turn around. Basically, the traveling twin must leave one reference frame and return back on another. The stay-at-home twin does not have to make such accelerations. The stay at home twin does not make such accelerations. Or does not make such changes in her reference frames. So it is the traveling twin and not the stay at home sister. Her stay at home twin who will be younger. All right, so that is the solution to the paradox. But it is it does make you think a little bit. All right, now, the twin paradox is real. Now, we saw this actually in a recent movie. And I, I totally... Uh, I totally recommend this movie. We saw the twin paradox. If you if you watch the movie Interstellar, you saw an example of the twin paradox. So again, let, those of you who haven't seen Interstellar, I mean, I, I suggest to watch it, but I'll try not to spoil it for anybody. 
But we had the movie Interstellar and it came out not too long ago. I don't know, a few years ago, I guess. And the movie had Matthew McConaughey in it. And it had um, uh, Anne Hathaway as the, uh, I believe she's the, uh, she was the, uh, the scientist. You know? so, ha so McConaughey was an astronaut. And then, strangely enough, you know, his daughter was being taught false information. For some weird reason, uh, the government or whatever was trying to deny that certain uh, events with regarding space travel ever occurred. The moon landing was fake, for instance, you know, and so they're being taught all this wrong stuff in school. McConaughey knew better because McConaughey was there, you know, that, you know, well, but he later, you know, he retired as an astronaut and he became a farmer. Now, one of the problems in this movie was the, the earth was falling apart. You know, we ignored climate change and, you know, some of the, some of the uh, disastrous, uh, you know, effects of not taking care of the earth. And so the earth, we, you know, crops started failing. In fact, it got to a point where humans could no longer live on the earth. So McConaughey became this hero. Well, actually, before that, these uh, set of uh, astronauts, um, one, let's see, one of them, I think was the name was Edmonds, another one was, was Miller, and I think there's somebody else. They discovered that some beings had put a wormhole near Saturn. You could follow this wormhole to a location where there were some stars that had planets around. One of them was a black hole. So there's planets that were that were uh, potential uh, candidates for new homes to people on Earth. And so one of the planets was called Miller's planet. Miller's planet was going around a black hole. Black hole has tremendous gravity. You know, again, the gravity is so in intense that not even light can escape a black hole. So as you remember, you know, back in our, you know, back in, you know, you know that uh, centripetal force is mv squared over r. Well, if you have a, a very, very, very large mass, you're going to have extremely large velocity, right? So mv squared over r is, you know, gmm over r squared, right? So the combination of the two, you're going to have the, this, this planet is going to be whipping around in an extremely large velocity because of the large capital M, right? So you're gonna have a huge velocity because of this balance between, of course, centripetal force and Newton's law of gravitation. Now, in fact, because it's a black hole, the velocity was so incredible that if you spent one, for every one hour that you spend on that planet, all the people, all your friends and family back on Earth age seven years. Okay, so again, you know, the long and short of it is, you know, Miller's planet, we're trying to discover a new home, right? So, so Miller's planet orbited a black hole. And hence had a relativistic orbital speed such that due to time dilation, and very real. For every one hour you spend on this planet, people on Earth age 
age seven years. So the idea is you want to get on there and get off there. But the problem is because of the tremendous gravity, you had tremendous tidal forces too. And so they happen to gotten in trouble with a very, very, very tall tidal wave. And in fact, I think it killed one of the people in this movie. So McConaughey was there. So they ended up spending, I think, five hours there, something like that. So they they were there and people around, you know, all the people on earth were more than with age, like 35 years. So it'd be like this, right? Um, you know, I had my daughter when I was 35 and my son when I was 36. If I spent five hours on that planet, I would be the exact same age as my daughter. If I spent longer on that planet, my daughter and my son would be older than me. Okay. Turns out in this movie, McConaughey watched his daughter die as an elderly woman when McConaughey was still a young man. Those elderly woman. Now, now I, I I looked at this, you know, at this movie, and you know, and and um. My wife watched it with me and she asked me, she was like, do you, do you see this movie as being realistic from your physics perspective? And I said, well, the, uh, the plot's cheesy. You know, I mean, of course, we have, the, we have the, uh, the, top, the top astronaut happens to have a daughter who is the top scientist in the world, right? But all the physics, I couldn't find anything wrong with the physics. Physics was, you know, most of the time when I see a movie, I could tear it apart and I say, oh yeah, that's, you know, you look at the Martian, for instance, I mean, the Martian, you know, there's no way you're going to have giant powerful dust storms because the air on mars is way too thin you know that it's so a whole concept of the powerful dust storms and the martian is is completely false but everything in this interstellar movie the physics checked out then i looked and say oh i see neil degrasse tyson loves the movie he raves about it. okay so he's gonna he's one of the top astronomers on the planet you know he's one of the top astronomers that we have on this planet. And, and so he likes it and of course then i looked and i saw the, i saw the executive director was Dr. Kip Thorne. Kip Thorne is a Caltech professor who happens to, who happens to have written the general relativity Bible, if you will, the, the, the seminal textbook on general theory of relativity. It's called Gravitation. So Kip Thorne is, he's a Nobel laureate now. He's an executive director. So again, the physics is going to check out. Uh, you know, Kip Thorne is the executive director. He all the physics got checked by him. And of course, Neil deGrasse, Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, so, so it, it, it didn't surprise me now that the physics was correct, but this is all, this is all right. This is all basically showing you time dilation. And they, they show, they talk about the Tesseract, you know, which is basically the multidimensional, the basically, you know, our, our space time uh, uh, complex, you know, our complex space time I'm talking about. And all, and so everything we talk about in this movie, you know, you can talk about it's real, it's realistic physics. I mean, it's, it's relativity. The physics is real. The, the, you know, the, again, the plot is kind of goofy, but you know, but again, you know, the physics at least is is checks out. So again, I would definitely suggest, you know, if you want to see a really cool movie, Interstellar. You know, it's been you, you have to check it and probably get it on Netflix now, but it's been out for you know for a long time. But anyway, you know, this is um, an example of time dilation. All right, so let me work a few problems out. I'm going to do open stacks uh, 28.1. All right, so open stacks 28.1 says, what is gamma? Uh, if V equals 0 0.250 C. And that's part A. And part B, uh, if V equals 0 0.500 C. Okay, so what is gamma? Gamma is again one over the square root of one minus v over c quantity squared. Okay, so I'm looking at v over c equals 0 
So I put, you know, for part A, I put that's going to be one over the square root of one minus 0 0.250 squared. And I get the gamma is 1.0328. That's the Lorentz factor, 1.0328. So again, twenty-five percent. You know, we ought to be think. We definitely ought to be thinking about relativity. If, if we don't use relativity, our answer is going to be off by about three percent. Okay, right. You know, and again, the question is, when do you have to start worrying about relativity? Well, roughly, rough when it's I, usually the rule of thumbs like fifteen to twenty percent the speed of light, because this Lorentz factor is telling you. I mean, if you don't need relativity at all, the Lorentz factor is right around one point zero. When you start seeing this number grow, is is the indication that you start you need to start using relativity. Okay, what about part B? Well, part B gamma is one over can V over C in this case is 0 0.500. So one minus 0 0.500 squared, square root of that. And we get um 1.155. Definitely want to use relativity. Be off by your answer will be off by 15 percent, 15, 16 percent. Got to use relativity. I can't, can't get away from me. You. you really need to use relativity here too. Again, when do you use relativity? Look at gamma. If gamma is appreciable away from 1.0, relativity is needed. If gamma is around 1.00 or so, you don't need relativity. And gamma is your test whether you need to use relativity or not. All right. Opus X 28.3. All right. Uh, particles called pi mesons. We've been talking about these particles. Called pi meson. Are produced by accelerator beams. Okay. Uh, if these particles travel. At 2.70 times 10 eighth meters per second, and live 2.60 times 10 to the negative eighth seconds, when at rest relative to an observer. Um, how long do they live as viewed in the laboratory? <clears throat> All right. Live when uh, viewed in the laboratory, uh, as viewed. So we have to read relativity problems very carefully. Okay, so particles called pi mesons are produced by accelerator beams. If these particles travel at 2.70 times 78 meters per second, again, that's V. That is the uh, velocity of one reference frame with respect to another, assuming that one reference frame, the pi mesons are at rest and moving with respect to the laboratory. 
They live 2.6 zero times 10 to the negative eight seconds when at rest relative to an observer. That means in their rest frame. They live this long in a frame in which they are at rest. That is called the proper time. That's like Sally moving along in the train. Again, you're imagining an observer moving along with the pi meson. At, so the observer is going to notice the pi meson at rest. And the lifetime of that pi meson will be 2.6 year old and sending of eight seconds. That's your proper time. How long do they live as viewed in the laboratory? Again, as a laboratory, now you're Sam. You're watching Sally. You're in the laboratory and you're watching the pi meson move by. You're going to, you're going to be you're going to be measuring the pi meson as having a larger time, a longer lifetime. Okay? So let's um let me erase this for real estate purposes here. You have to read this very carefully. So as you read this, again, the proper time, as I just mentioned, is delta T naught. That's your 2.60 times 10 to the negative eight seconds. Your velocity of one reference frame, the pi mesons reference frame with respect to the laboratory reference frame, that velocity is gonna be 2.70 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, very, very close to the speed of light. You want delta T. That's the velocity as measured in the lab, oh, sorry, that's a time duration, the lifetime as measured in the laboratory. Okay, so again, this is the lifetime as measured in the rest frame. This is the lifetime as measured in the laboratory. And in the laboratory, you're watching a pi meson move at a velocity V. That's the reference frame. The pi meson has its own reference frame and it's moving at a velocity V with respect to the laboratory. All right, so what's the time dilation equation? Delta T is delta T naught divided by the square root of one minus V over C quantity squared. Delta T is 2.60 times 10 to the negative eight seconds divided by one minus, I have 2.70 times 10 to the eight meters per second divided by 3.0 times 10 to the eight meters per second. Don't forget to square this. And all of this is in the, under a square root radical. Working all this out, you find out that delta T is going to be 5.96 times 10 to the negative eight seconds. All right. Longer than the lifetime in the rest frame. All right, let's look at OpenStax 28.5. Okay, um, a neutral pi meson. is a particle that can be created by accelerator beams. All right, and just like we just talked about a moment ago. 
if one such particle lives, uh, 1.40 times 10 negative 16 seconds. as measured in the laboratory. And zero point eight four zero. times 10 to the negative 16 seconds uh, when at rest relative to an observer. What is its velocity relative to the laboratory? Okay, a neutral, so again, you need to read this very carefully. A neutral pi meson is a particle that can be created by accelerator beams. Again, like we just said in the last problem. If one such particle lives 1.40 times 10 to 16 seconds as measured in the laboratory. Again, again, that's me, the observer, measuring this lifetime of the pi meson going by at a velocity v. And 0 0.840 times 10 to the negative 16 seconds when at rest relative to an observer. That is imagining an observer like Sally riding along with the pi meson in its, in, its, uh, in, its, in its reference frame going at speed v. This will be the proper time, the proper time, the proper lifetime. Okay. What is the velocity? What is v? So again, we know delta t, and that is the time measured by somebody watching the pi meson moving by the velocity v. Again, the pi meson is in a reference frame where an observer is at rest with the pi meson. It's at a reference frame that's moving at a velocity v relative to the laboratory, the stationary laboratory. So it's gonna, so anybody watching from the stationary laboratory is gonna watch, it's gonna look at the pi meson and see its lifetime as delta t, 1.40 to 16 seconds. If you have an observer moving along with the pi meson, like Sally moving along in the train, then you'll see a delta t, uh, delta t naught, the proper time of 0 0.840 to 16 seconds. We want to find out what is v. What is the velocity v with, of, of one uh, of the pi meson, um, the pi meson's reference frame with respect to the laboratory? We want V. Okay, so I need, to, I need to erase this for real estate. So again, I explained what these various uh, quantities are. So let's just kind of write them, write them down. Okay, um, so I know the proper time, the proper lifetime will be um, 0 0.840. Delta T naught is 0 0.840 times 10 to the negative 16 seconds. Okay. Um, I also know the lifetime as measured by a person in the laboratory, and that'll be um, uh, 1.40. times 10 to the negative 16 seconds, okay? What I want is V. Again, this is another time dilation problem, right? So again, delta T is delta T naught divided by the square root of one minus V over C on D squared. 
I want to solve for B. B is sandwiched in this little, in this radical. So what I'll do, I'm going to do some algebra. I'm going to, I'll switch partners here. I'll put the square root where the delta T is. I'll put delta T below delta T naught, all right? So again, I'll write that one minus B over C squared, I have a square root of that, is delta T naught over delta T. Let us now square both sides. One minus B over C, quantity squared is delta T naught over delta T squared. Now, I'm going to do two steps of algebra one. I'm going to subtract the one and multiply through by a negative one, okay? So I'm going to write this now as B over C squared, okay? will be one minus delta T naught over delta T quantity squared. Now I will take the square root of both sides. I now have B over C is one minus, I have delta T naught over delta T squared that and take the square root. And I have one more step of algebra. I have the V equals C. And then times that's radical. One minus delta T naught over delta T squared. Take the square root of all that. There you are. Now it's a matter of plugging in some numbers. I get V equals C. And I have one minus, let's see here. Uh, 0 0.840 times 10 to the negative 16 seconds over 1.40 times 10 to the negative 16 seconds. Don't forget the square of the, this ratio. Take the square root of that. I find when I do that, that V is equal to 0 0.800 C. Eighty percent the speed of light. <clears throat> Again, another time dilation problem. So we've got another time dilation problem here. Um, look at Opus X 28.9. Okay, open stacks, 28.9. Uh, at what relative velocity velocity? At what relative velocity is? Gamma equal to 1.50. That's part A. B. Uh, at what relative velocity is gamma equals 100? Okay, so again, this is a direct application of what gamma is. So gamma, remember, is um, one divided by the square root of one minus V over C quantity squared. So again, I want to solve for the relative velocity. I want to solve for V. So again, very similar algebra as last time. I'm going to switch partners here. I'm going to put the radical where gamma is, put gamma downstairs. So I have the square root of one minus B over C. Quantity squared is one over gamma. Let me square both sides. One minus V over C. 
quantity squared is one over gamma squared. Again, I'm gonna subtract both sides by one, multiply through by negative one. Again, that's two sets of algebra one. <clears throat> I get V over C quantity squared is one minus one over gamma squared. Let me take the square root of both sides. B over C is the square root of one minus one over gamma squared. Finally, V is C, the square root of one minus one over gamma squared. Okay, so basically the common, the, what I need to do at this point is I just need to substitute different values for gamma. So part A, so okay, let me just kind of rewrite this equation, get myself some more room here. Okay, so my uh, final answer, remember, is B equals C <clears throat> square root one minus one over gamma squared. For part A, we're gonna let gamma equal 1.50. V is then C times square root of one minus one over 1.50 squared. We find out that V is going to be 0 0.745 C, 74.5% of the speed of light. You get a Lorentz factor of 1.50. Part B. We let gamma equal 100. V equals C square root. 1 minus 1 over 100 squared. I mean, this is 1 minus almost nothing, so it's going to be really close to the speed of light. So V is going to be, if I look at that, I go, it's going to be 0 0.99995C. 0 0.99995C. Very, very, very close to the speed of light, but of course, not quite the speed of light. 